This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Lately, all the news out of the Capitol and Hartford points to the state's dire budget situation, billions of dollars in the hole, and no real solutions yet from lawmakers. But there are plenty of bills before legislators, too that are getting lost in the discussion, like whether the General Assembly should approve paid family and medical leave here in Connecticut. Coming up, we'll hear about a community conversation tonight that focuses on bringing different voices into the debate, including women of color. That's later this hour. First, the racial divide in America. Today, where we live, we speak with Heather McGee. She's president of the public policy organization Demos in New York City. McGee will be in the state next week to talk about this subject, the racial divide, at the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy's annual meeting. Now, McGee made headlines last summer just by the way she answered a question about prejudice during an appearance on C-SPAN. Her exchange provides lessons for all of us on how to navigate what can be uncomfortable conversations on race. We want to hear from you. 860-275-7266. You can email where we live at WNPR.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Now, Heather McGee is joining us by phone. Welcome to Where We Live, Heather. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. Uh, for our listeners who don't know about Demos, tell us about your group. Sure, absolutely. So Demos, um, which is the Greek word for the people and the root word of democracy, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, but values-led public policy organization headquartered in New York. Uh, and our mission is to create an America where we all have an equal say in our democracy and an equal chance in our economy. And we do that with research, advocacy, litigation, uh, and basically have been working on issues like regulating the credit card companies so that they're more fair and transparent, giving working and middle class families a, a chance to build assets and save for the future, um, trying to mainstream the idea of refunding public college, uh, public colleges so that we can return to a system of debt-free public college for all, and then really improving our democracy with things like uh, universal uh, voting and uh, campaign finance reform, like the public financing system in Connecticut. We also actually do wake up work on paid family leave, so I was glad to hear about your uh, town hall conversation this evening. Uh, so there's a lot uh, that Demos uh, is talking about. Um, I understand you've been president of the organization for more than three years, but you kind of got in the spotlight late last summer when you were a uh, featured guest on C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Um, there was this exchange, a caller from uh, North Carolina. His name was Gary. Uh, let's hear what he asked you. I'm a white male, and I am prejudiced. Hmm. And the reason it is, is something I wasn't taught, but it's kind of something that I learned. Um, when I open up the papers, I get very discouraged at what, young black males are doing to each other and the, the crime rates. I understand that they live in an environment with a lot of drugs. You have to get money for drugs. And, and, it, and it's a deep issue that goes beyond that. But when you, I have these different fears, and I don't want my fears to come true, you know, so I try to avoid that. And I, and I come off as being prejudice, but I just have fears. I don't like to be forced to like people. I like to be led to like people through example. And what can I do to change, you know, to be a better American? You were getting a lot of questions uh, during that appearance on C-SPAN. And then Gary called with this this comment, this question to you. What was going on in your mind when you, when you heard what he was asking you? You know, it, you have to remember this was mid-August last year, in the sort of dog days of a very racially charged summer. You had the Trump campaign, you had the police killings, and then the, um, you know, terrible uh, events in, in Dallas and, and Baton Rouge. Um, it was just a fraught moment. And, um, you know, I was on that show, and, you know, there'd been probably a half a dozen callers before Gary, um, you know, asking questions about health care and student debt and the stuff I normally actually talk about, public policy issues that affect us all. And, you know, when I first heard him with that opening line, uh, I'm a white male and I'm prejudiced, uh, you know, my kind of, you know, my breath caught. I thought, oh, boy, you know, these fans actually sort of known for having kind of racist callers call in in the middle of the day. Um, but then he went on and 
by the time he ended and said, you know, how can I change to become a better American, um, I was really actually moved. And um, I was sort of able to ignore the, you know, kind of stereotypes that he had talked about and, and really try to hear what he was really looking for, which was a connection and sort of a way out. And so my first thought was uh, to thank him. So I said, thank you. Thank you for admitting your prejudice, um, because that is the most important, powerful step we can make right now. How did you keep your emotions at bay? Because watching <laughs> that, this is the first time I watched it, actually, was just a few days ago. Uh-huh. You kept your composure. Um, he wasn't saying anything. Um, you know, there, were no, there was no animosity in his tone. He was really earnestly asking for advice. And he was just so candid. We don't hear that anymore these days. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you know, Donald Trump talks about, um, you know, Mexicans as rapists and criminals, and yet he says there's not not a racist bone in his body. So here is this sort of every man just saying, listen, like, yes, obviously I have these prejudices. I have these beliefs about uh, black men and crime in the inner cities, right? Um, And and I'm afraid. And, um, And so I was able to sort of hear what he really was looking for. Um, Frankly, I was grateful. Um, So often right now, we're at loggerheads about the just fundamental question of whether prejudice exists, whether racism uh, is a part of the American society or not, uh, how bad slavery was, right? Something that Bill O'Reilly loved to to talk about was that slavery really wasn't that bad because, you know, the slaves who built the White House had potatoes. And so when you actually have someone just admitting it, that takes in some ways the sort of first fight off the table. And then he was asking me what to do. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I, you know, that's a question I've I've never gotten before. You know, (laughs) what do you actually do if you've admitted it and now you want to change? And so I said the first things that came to the top of my head. So tell us, what was the advice you gave to Gary? He (laughs) asked you, how do I become a better American? Yeah. Well, I thought that was a really beautiful um, way to formulate that question. In some ways, that's probably the thing that caught me the most, because I, I deeply believe that in our country, uh, which is a land of ancestral strangers where um, you know there's someone here, there's someone in Connecticut with a tie to every community on the globe, and we're all met here to make a community out of that uh, sort of, you know, predisposition to be strangers, um, and, and a demos. In fact, that's what our name means, the demos, the people of a nation. And so I said, you know, first of all, take that first step and, and get to know families of color um, and have that experience uh, run counter to the stereotypes that you see on television. Um, I told them to actually turn off the, the local news at night because studies show that uh, local news overrepresents black crime and underrepresents crime uh, done by white people. I could tell his his sort of frame of mind was really more sort of a black white frame. So, um, and I'm an African American, and so that's the face he was looking at on television. So I talked about that. I said if he was a religious person, he should uh, join an interracial church or a black church. Um, that he should read about, uh, you know, African American and, and the history of this country, about sort of a more multiracial history, multicultural history of how this country was built, um, and that he should really be unafraid to continue the conversation uh, about race, about stereotypes, about prejudice um, in his community. And the crazy thing is, is that that clip. Um, that exchange, it was, you know, a three-minute, you know, him asking me the question and then me responding uh, was posted on Facebook and went viral um, over the course of the first weekend. It got over a million views, and now I think it's over 10 million on various different websites. Um, and, you know, there was coverage on it in local newspapers and magazines, and and then the greatest thing ever happened, um, the greatest sort of end to this story although it's still ongoing, is that Gary found me. Um, He saw my Twitter handle when I was on TV uh, the following week. He watches a lot of TV. (laughs) Um, And he went on Twitter for the first time. He said, uh, he said his first tweet was, how does this thing work? Uh, and he 
Uh, he found me, and I direct messaged him, and I, and I gave him my phone number because I wanted to talk to him. I mean, you know, the show sort of went on after that exchange, and, you know, they don't take last names and, and everything, so I had no way to find him. But we had a great first conversation where he, you know, to my uh, hum, humbling surprise, said that he had really taken my recommendations to heart and um, that he had begun to do the things that I had said and that he was taking seriously the idea mm-hmm. of transforming his life. And we, Gary and I, have now actually become friends. And I've met with him in person a handful of times, and he is still totally focused mm-hmm. on this issue of becoming a better American, and he works at it every day. This is where we live. I'm speaking with Heather McGee, president of Demos, a public policy organization based in New York City. She'll be in the state next week for a Connecticut Council of Phil- Philanthropy event. Uh, but we're talking about a video of her and this this man named Gary that went viral uh, from Sp- C-SPAN last summer, just because there was a real co- candid conversation about race. And as we hear, as we heard right now, uh, uh, Heather said that uh, she and Gary went on to meet. They've met several times. Um, what was the reaction from other people? You said millions have seen this clip. Um, are, other, are other people coming up to you and, and, and feeling, like they can, feeling like they can be comfortable talking about race? Because so many people, they don't quite know how to navigate this subject. Mm-hmm. Yes, that has definitely happened. Um, You know, it was very interesting. I think in some ways, you know, everything happens on social media. So the clip went on Facebook, and um, so there were, you know, thousands of comments to that. Um, Lots of different sort of, you know, kind of sites clipped it and posted it themselves. And so you really could see the kind of conversation that was happening by people who were drawn to this to this video and you know so often what's in our Facebook feeds is sort of curated to outrage us uh, and so uh, and to create outrage and so there's um, I think for so many people who responded to it people of color and white people men and women it was this moment of empathy this cross-racial cross-age cross-gender uh, empathy uh, between two Americans um, that really touched folks and um, I have since, you know, sometimes people recognize me, and they do. I mean, when I'm in person and people recognize me, and it's a person of color, often a, uh, an African-American, they say, I'm so glad it was you who got that question and that you were able to, to do that, so to respond so kind of unemotionally and calmly and, um, you know, sort of access your kind of better angel at that moment rather than be reactive. Because he did say some um you know, voice some stereotypes, some negative stereotypes about African Americans, and those negative stereotypes are are getting us killed. Mm. Um, those negative stereotypes are driving uh, health outcomes and education outcomes and job discrimination that is having uh, a demonstrable impact on Black families and Black children um, and Black workers. And so, it's not it's not without consequence the fact that those stereotypes are so easily at hand and so pervasive. Um, and then I've had a lot of white people come up to me and say, um, I'm so glad you answered that way. And, and I, too, um, have had a sort of reckoning about the question of, you know, my role in, in the racism in America and what I can actually do uh, to, to create a better um, society right now. I think we're all kind of waking up from the illusion that we could be post-racial. Um, you know, this election has really created that, the, the sort of rise of, 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 of white nationalism and white supremacy and mainstreaming of those ideas through social media and, and frankly, through, through Washington and people who have been put into place there. It's really um, it's a moment when I think everyone is sort of asking themselves, what is my role? What is my responsibility? What are my beliefs, both conscious and unconscious? And what do I do um, to, what am I, what are the, what am I doing uh, in my work, in my life, in my community uh, to create more cross-racial understanding? And we're going to talk more about what you've learned uh, from that experience uh, on C-SPAN and how that's influencing your work. Uh, this is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Heather McGee joins us by phone, president of Demos, a public policy organization based in New York. Uh, we're going to get to some more questions uh, after this break, take some listener phone calls, and we'll invite you to join the conversation. We'll also find out in this, in 2017, when we talk about the racial divide in America, how are educators approaching this subject?
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking with Heather McGee. She's president of Demos in New York City. She'll be in the state next week for a Connecticut Council for Philanthropy event. Uh, before the break, Heather, we were talking about that viral video from C-SPAN and how it's influenced your work, um, how people have responded, uh, the question about race uh, in this country. Um, I've watched a lot of interviews that you've done since then, and uh, you say that all of us, we all have prejudices. So uh, before the break, you mentioned, you know, what is our role individually of how we can have these conversations um, and to bridge that divide, so to speak? So, I, you know, as I said before, I really, my work, you know, Demos, we, we look at the big picture. We look at the structures in our society that, um, that create, you know, racial disparities. For example, we have a whole project on the racial wealth gap. Um, the I, the fact that today in America, um, the average white family has uh, about a, uh, sorry, the average African American family has less than a dime in wealth for every uh, dollar that the average white family has, and it's uh, similar for Af- uh, Latino households. Um, that's a question not of what individuals have done, because you know, a black and white family that uh, have the same education, the same job and income will have vastly different wealth, uh, home ownership, um, any kind of inheritance, even if it's just, you know, stocks from your grandfather, uh, retirement savings. And that changes outcomes for individual families. And that's a matter of public policy, of the fact that there were racially discriminatory laws until really quite recently in how uh, uh, and how we were families were allowed to build assets. So we normally talk at that level, the level of structures and policies um, that affect us all. But it's also true that we live in a society where um, race, the idea of people being uh, fundamentally different from one another in some immutable, unchangeable way, and the belief in a hierarchy of human value that some people and groups are just better than others is really embedded in so much of our culture. And we have other parts of our culture, too, that embrace diversity, that celebrate the idea of the individual, that want us to all be colorblind, and yet those sort of better angels and those um, more uh, kind of nefarious and divisive threads in our society are kind of constantly at war with each other. They come out all the time in politics. Uh, We see that very much where racism is used often as a kind of political weapon to divide, um, you know, oftentimes to divide uh, white working and middle class people from uh, from people of color who are struggling uh, in very much the same conditions to sort of scapegoat uh, one another. And so we think it's also important to, at the same time as we're trying to, you know, advance policies that help working and middle class families of all races, uh, like paid family leave and raising the minimum wage and um, uh, and making it easier for folks to vote, we also think it's really important for us to um, acknowledge that our culture still has work to do and that stereotypes um, about people of color, about immigrants, about, is, about um, Muslims uh, are pervasive in our society and they affect us at the unconscious level. And so it's nearly universally more difficult for um, people taking an implicit bias test uh, to, you know, associate quickly uh, positive words with darker faces. Um, and we know that those split-second decisions that people make, um, whether it's in a classroom, whether it's pulling someone over for a tra- traffic stop, whether it's in a, a, a callback interview for a job, end up being um, you know, racially inflected. And so what can we do? Um, and that's the part that I'm really excited about, that there's actually a lot of work being done across the country to give people tangible tools to uh, really get to the point of admitting and understanding how racism works in their minds, how people's group identities are often as important as their kind of individual identities in terms of the way we interact with one another, um, and how there are power dynamics related to different identities. At Demos, when I became president, and I took over uh, from Miles Rappaport, who is a longtime Connecticut uh, public servant. He was a state legislator, a secretary of Con- uh, state in Connecticut. Um, Uh, When I took over, we went through this process, and it's still ongoing, to have every single member of the staff 
um, do more than diversity training, really actually understand um, the history of this country, uh, the history of their own family in this country, uh, the ways that uh, interacting with people of different races makes them feel the kinds of reactions that people normally have uh, when being in mixed settings, um, just developing a degree of self-awareness mm -hmm. about uh, the way that race and gender and difference and disability um, sort of play out in your life every day. And then most importantly, seeking out integrated spaces and places and communities because nothing is more powerful to counteract stereotypes than uh, individual mm -hmm. relationships and actually working together across difference uh, towards a common goal. You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. I wanted to take a call from Rob, who's calling from Costcob. Rob, you're on the show. Oh, hi. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that your guest is unbelievably well-spoken about such a complex issue. I've never heard it parsed in, in uh, such a meaningful way. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, you know, racism uh, it begins in the home. That's the second thing. It, it has to be uh, modeled by a parent. And if there's any indication that it's uh, you know, a racist or prejudiced attitude by a parent, the kid is more likely to, most likely to follow that lead. You know, my father was a Jew who came from Germany, and I heard him in the 70s, in his mid-50s, start to go in that direction. And it, I don't know, maybe it's just my own personality, my liberal bent, but I would get on his case about it because of his own uh, background. You know, he would be the, he should be the last person to do that. Finally, what I told the screener was, I go into the city a lot, and um, I make a conscious effort, and again, maybe it's just my own predisposition to, toward doing that, um, but it, when I sit on the subway, uh, when I'm in a park, if I'm in an elevator, and there's somebody who's you know clearly different from me, um, I make an effort to say something, and it often will engage a a longer conversation, whether it's at Starbucks or the security guard or whomever. And it takes an effort and a conscious effort to do something like that, which I just don't think, you know, most people either have the time or willingness. And I don't want to say courage, cause, but it does involve a certain type of courage to approach a stranger. My wife thinks I'm a little nutty when I do that, but that's how I think prejudice mm -hmm. is best broken down. What your guest talks about is so sophisticated, but for, for sort of the average person, they don't have the time or, or uh, I think, willingness to parse it in such an intellectual way. And I'll, I'll take my, yeah. I'll, I'll end it at that. <laughs> well, thank you, Rob, for those comments. It, it reminded me, uh, Heather McGee, um, you've had this relationship now, this friendship with Gary from North Carolina. You've met him several times, and he told you his approach to combating um, his assumptions or stereotypes of, of trying to move past that. Can you let our listeners know in the terms yeah, I, of just making that conversation that Rob even suggested? Absolutely. Um, I, I heard a lot in actually where Gary has, has traveled to and what Rob was saying. And Rob, I want to thank you for your comments. That was very, very kind. Um, uh, so Gary has begun to, and Gary um, lives alone with his dog, you know, um, like so many Americans. Um, actually, the, the feeling of being isolated and lonely has actually doubled uh, in the past 40 years. The Surgeon General of the United States is actually talking about this a lot now. And that's, that's a big part of it. You know, he spends a lot of his time at home watching television and so much of this, the news, the cable news and the reality shows where you really do see the worst of Americans and particularly of immigrants and uh, people of color just sort of caricatured. Um, and so what he decided to do after our phone call was get out mm -hmm. and force himself uh, to leave the house at least once a day even if it was going, you know, to the VA and just sitting in the lobby or, or driving around. And he forced himself to do this little, little, he created a system. This was all his own innovation where he would see someone who was a, um, a person of color and uh, write down in a little notepad on a scale of 1 to 10 how kind of intimidated or um, anxious or afraid or prejudiced he was against them, sort of just immediately um, by seeing them. 
and then he would force himself to interact with them, say, how's the weather, the traffic was really bad, you know, how long you've been waiting in this line, whatever it is, really the things that Rob was just saying. Um, and then afterwards, he would go back and he would write uh, on that same 1 to 10 scale how he felt after the interaction. And it was always, um, you know, uh, a high number in terms of his level of, of kind of prejudice and, and, and just sort of feeling of, of alienation from that person. And then it would drop down precipitously after the conversation, whether it was, you know, um, a group of black guys hanging out in a parking lot or, um, you know, an older black woman uh, sitting at the VA or, uh, you know, someone working as a security guard or um, behind a counter. And, um, it, you know, it seems sort of basic, but uh, you know, when you live in a very diverse society um, that really has very few channels for um, interaction and uh, kind of meaningful integration, um, uh, it's really important to take that step. And not every interaction will be great, right? Some people don't want to talk to somebody else, no matter what race they are. Um, but just that feeling of trust that recognize the hu- recognizes the humanity in people um, who are different from you uh, can have an impact in sort of rewiring the human brain Mm -hmm. to have different split-second reactions to people uh, who are different than you. This is where we live. We're speaking with Heather McGee, president of DEMOS, a public policy organization based in New York City. The simple question, bridging the racial divide in America. Uh, you can join the conversation, 860-275-7266. I wanted to bring into the conversation now uh, Dorothea uh, Anagnostopoulos. She's executive director of teacher education and associate professor of curriculum and instruction at UConn's NEAG School of Education. Uh, Dorothea, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to reach out to you and when we were talking about this show and just the idea of encouraging regular folks to have conversations with each other, but then when we think about all of the complexities of talking about race in this country, we wondered how do educators tackle this subject? And that's why we wanted to, to hear from you, Dorothea. Uh, what are, some of, the, what are your, some of the takeaways of what you're hearing Heather say, and, and how do you see that um, in the classroom? Well, first of all, it was really interesting listening to Heather talk about uh, the work that she's doing in Demos and preparing their staff there, because in many ways, uh, when we work here with our pre-service teachers, we use many of the same approaches. Um, So one thing that we make sure to do is encourage our own students who are going to become teachers to really critically examine their own experiences and how those have been shaped by their various social identities, including their racial identities. Um, So we ask them to consider in particular how has their own schooling experiences really been shaped by their race and by issues of racism as well. Um, And in addition to that, we also um, engage them in really examining the structural dimensions of racism, Um, because oftentimes our students will focus immediately on kind of the interpersonal level, um, and but it's much more difficult to understand the structural level of racism. <clears throat> so we ask them to consider why their schools that they come from have been so racially segregated, mm-hmm. and to consider the relationship between racially segregated schools and housing policy, um, and to consider that these were really deliberate policies. These are not just the choices that individuals are making. And our racial segregation is just not a natural phenomenon. Um, And finally, we also encourage our pre-service teachers to uh, engage in what we call experiential learning. So here on campus, uh, we ask them to place themselves in situations where they will be a minority uh, and to reach out to um, students who are different than them according to their race, gender, sexual orientation. So I thought the parallels between what Heather was saying and our own preparation of our pre-service teachers were pretty close. Um, Very interesting to, to recognize those. 
When you look at um, the the teaching profession, we hear often about a lack of diversity. How does that pose challenges in the classroom? It's one thing to give uh, these uh, these teachers the tools to to understand the nuance and what's happening in neighborhoods, but then when they're in the classroom, like having that real conversation. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So two things. Absolutely, it's really imperative that. <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little bit of cold. <laughs> Um, It's really imperative that we actually increase the number of teachers of color uh, so that our teaching force can really better reflect our student population. I've been involved in several efforts here, both here at the University of Connecticut and in Michigan State University, where I used to be, uh, and we've really worked hard to increase the number of students of color in our own classrooms, and that has just so enriched our conversations when we talk about issues of race. And so I just think that it's really imperative and it's a piece of this puzzle. Um, and the second thing is that it's, I think oftentimes when we um, talk about issues of race, we're in a reactive situation. So we're responding to some uh, crisis in the country. Uh, I think Heather mentioned, you know, the police killings of black and brown people and certainly the election, um, that we also try to consider, help our teachers really consider that these conversations have to be part of the ongoing curriculum Mm -hmm. uh, and that we can really have, um, make gains in our conversation around race if we have an inclusive curriculum in which students are reading about diverse Um, groups and their histories and experiences. Um, We also talk to our pre-service teachers about the importance of what I call dialogic instruction. Uh, So the need to really prepare students to engage in discussions that they can examine multiple perspectives, uh, that they, when they reason and think, that they ground it in evidence, because that's very important. Um, And ultimately that they take responsibility for the weight of their words. Mm. Uh, Heather talked about empathy, and um, I think that's very important. Uh, Students in our classrooms need to understand that their words matter, uh, and they need to really accept responsibilities for those words. At the same time, they need to be able to express, you know, their questions, and like Heather said, Gary Mm. was able to be honest about his own prejudices. Mm. Heather McGee, did you want to respond about the tools that we, um, that educators can give, uh, you know, upcoming teachers uh, in in cities and towns around this country to talk about race in a, in a meaningful way? Yeah, I think um, just hearing uh, as a, you know, if you have a racially diverse student body, those um, students just hearing that their lives um, and the realities that they know to be true about their interactions with uh, police officers, their interactions with uh, with people in authority, their parents' interactions on the job are real. Um, that first acknowledgement uh, that prejudice and racism are real and pervasive is so important to be that first opening door. Um, and then just, you know, taking it to the more sort of structural level, one of the major barriers, we've been working with a, a lot of teachers groups to, uh, to having more um, people of color and working class people uh, moved into the uh, the teaching profession is student debt. Um, and that goes back to that uh, racial wealth gap that I talked about, the idea that um, to go to college, African American and Latino and Native American uh, students have to borrow more because mm-hmm. they don't have that intergenerational family savings um, that helps defray the cost of college. And so they come out having to spend half of their income in debt payments. And so, uh, you know, taking a a modest salary as a teacher um, is a real, um, is a real struggle. And so debt forgiveness programs and, um, uh, you know, making public college systems free and debt free is a really important part that's sort of upstream from this problem, Mm -hmm. uh, but significant nonetheless. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Heather McGee's on the line, president of Demos, a public policy organization based in New York City. Uh, we have time for a, a quick listener uh, call. Uh, Jackie from West Hartford, uh, what's your question or comment? Hi. Um, great show, as always. 
I'd like to get um, Heather's feedback and see also if her organization is planning on doing anything about this regarding gerrymandering. Because I feel that the rise of gerrymandering, both on the Republican and Democrat side, has increased the need not to have a conversation. When your districts are safe, mm. you don't need to talk to the other side. And I think that's really hurting our country. It's hurting the level and the quality of conversation we have in Washington. And as a result, it's hurting all of us. So I'd like your thoughts, and I'd like to know if your organization's trying to do anything about getting rid of gerrymandering. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Jackie, that's a great question and a great point. Um, and I agree. Uh, when we at Demos look at uh, democracy reforms, our guiding principle is to make uh, our uh, the promise of self-governance real. And so many of the structures that, uh, frankly, have been you know embedded in our in our laws for for generations uh, and were created at a time when the explicit goal was to keep uh, power out of the hands of working class people, out of the hands uh, of people of color, um, have really distorted our democracy. Um, and it's only gotten worse, uh, obviously, as I think we all know, um, across the country since uh, since 2010, um, when one party really decided that um, using the tools of our uh, voting system and election system to gain power was going to be sort of the uh, the first order of business. So um, the explicit uh, gerrymandering to create, you know, distorted and safe seats um, that have made real uh, kind of uh, uh, distortions of 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 the electorate uh, across the country, but particularly um, in the South and the Southwest. Uh, are, are just deeply anti-democratic. And Demos has worked on the issue of redistricting reform and will continue to. Um, what it comes down to, sadly, at this point, is um, the need for all of us to really pay attention to our state legislative races. Um, so often those kind of go under the radar. But we have a redistricting period coming up for, um, for Congress uh, that will be decided um, by the 2020 census. And so the next elections, making sure that a commitment to democracy is, is something that you press your state legislatures on when you go to the ballot and vote in 2018 is enormously important. And then there are good common sense reforms that both take the need to not have overly partisan districts and uh, the need to make sure mm -hmm. that uh, you know, minority communities um, can still represent the can uh, elect the candidates of their choice. Um, we have those kinds of reforms. It's just a question of whether or not we have legislators who are really interested in democracy and not just self-preservation in those seats. And we have to leave it there. We're out of time. Heather McGee, again, president of DEMOS, a public policy organization based in New York City. She's going to be in Connecticut next Friday, May 12th, for the Connecticut Council for Philanthropy's annual meeting. More information on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. Heather, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Also, Dorothea Anagnostopoulos, Executive Director of Teacher Education, Associate Professor of Curriculum and Instruction at UConn's NEAG School of Education. Thank you. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, the debate for paid family and medical leave continues in Connecticut. We'll learn about efforts to include communities of color into this conversation. That's just ahead. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Tonight, a coalition of community groups in Connecticut are hosting a conversation about paid family and medical leave in the state. Now, this is not the first time the bill has been before the General Assembly. The latest calls for creating an employee fund that workers would pay into with the ability to use that paid leave when needed such as for the birth of a child or caring for a sick relative or elderly parent. The conversation happening tonight in Hartford uh, could help communities of color. This conversation is being hosted by a consortium of groups, including Planned Parenthood of Southern New England, also AARP of Connecticut, among others. Now, joining me in studio is Arvia Walker. She's a political and social justice organizer involved in the paid leave campaign. Arvia, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Lucy. 
Tell us about this conversation tonight, why it's needed. So we are having this conversation um, where the event is called A Seat at the Table, and we decided to ha- to call it A Seat at the Table because of Solange Knowles, her iconic album that just came out, because um, we really feel that the campaign for paid family leave um, needs to really work on centering women of color stories. Um, so some of the unique challenges that women of color face, um, well, the challenge, the The challenges that women of color face when talking about paid family leave are unique. So not only are we um, talking about the fact that folks have to make the impossible decision between taking care of ourselves and our family members and taking um, time off of work with the job that we need, but we're also dealing with um, issues simultaneously with issues like pay inequity and low-wage jobs um, and health disparities. Um, So we really want to talk about those unique challenges and how women of color are impacted by paid family leave and center that in the campaign. I mentioned that this bill is not the first time in the session, another session where it's been before legislators. Uh, Do you feel that uh, that this conversation has uh, uh, excluded uh, women of color, um, that it's focused too much on uh, white working class women, how it could benefit them? Um, I don't think it's excluded, but I don't think as um, a campaign we've done a great job. I think we um, there are some opportunities for us to improve and really creating platforms where women of color can share their stories um, and to talk about these unique challenges. Um, this is really a great opportunity to talk about the intersections of economic justice and racial justice. So um, when we're talking about these issues, it looks a lot different for women of color. Um, so this is just a, the start of a conversation. Um, we have women of color who are involved in the conversation, but we know that that we need to elevate them um, because traditionally in our country, in our world, women of color are left out um, of policymaking decisions, out of um, decision-making tables. So it's time for us to bring our stories to the forefront so that we're making good policy um, that will impact everyone because we know if we center the folks who are most marginalized, everyone will benefit and everyone in our state will be impacted. Let's talk about the disadvantages when someone doesn't have the ability, um, this policy that doesn't exist. So if they have a, a new child at home, not feeling that they could be, you know, spend some time with their child because they're going to lose their job. Can you talk about like the real life consequences of not having this kind of program here in Connecticut? Yes. So tonight we'll have um, some folks on the panel who actually have experienced this. One of the women who um, who will be sitting on the on the panel, um, she actually had um, an experience when she with her first child, um, where she was working at um, a, a low wage a low wage job. Um, so she was already making. Um, um, I'm thinking under 1010 10, because low wage jobs usually are 1010 10 or less. And she was she she went through her pregnancy and she was faced with having to take the time off without pay. So what do you do when you're in that situation? So maybe you have your medical expenses covered if you have if you have the the privilege to have health insurance, which is which is another conversation. But what do you do about your rent? What do you do about your light bill? What do you do about feeding your child? Um, what about what do you do about feeding yourself? So all of these things aren't covered um, when you have to take time off to either take care of yourself or a family member. Um, so um, it is, it's time for as a country that we start looking at economic justice, justice issues as human rights issues um, because we know a lot about reducing disparities. Um, so it is, it's basically time for us to start making it a priority. So how do we center um, this conversation around paid family leave and making sure that folks know that this is a human right and folks shouldn't have to make this impossible decision? Uh, joining the conversation now is Catherine Bailey, She's Deputy Director of the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund. Catherine, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much, Lucy. Uh, We've talked about paid family and medical leave before this proposal for this program. Often when we talk about it, people think immediately, well, this would help if someone has a new baby. But this would actually help any worker. Tell us how that would impact them if they needed to take a leave from their job. Absolutely. You know, people do think about this as solely a maternity leave issue, as you said, but it's not just about having babies. Um, It's about people needing this for their own illness when they're hit with cancer or a stroke or heart disease or when they have a family member uh, who has an injury or or serious illness as well. So um, it's it impacts pretty much almost everyone at some point in their lives. Uh, we hear often from the business community, uh, some would say that this would hurt uh, businesses, but talk about the way that the legislation is written, uh, what is proposed, and who would be paying into it? What would be the cost, if at all, to employers? It, it's nothing, and that's the biggest myth of this program. Uh, what's proposed is actually a self-funded program, so employees in the workforce 
uh, would be making a, a small contribution into a large pool, and if they needed to draw from it, they would do so. Um, so that that's a big myth that's out there. And, you know, we've heard from states that have had this for many years have had incredibly positive impacts for business. They have increased morale, boosted productivity, uh, lower turnover costs, and they attract the best talent to their jobs. Um, and, and it is a, re- a way to retain women in the workforce as well. You mentioned other states. Can you tell us about who has this type of program already in existence? Sure. California passed it more than a decade ago. Uh, New Jersey, Rhode Island have this program as well. Uh, New York passed it last year, and the District of Columbia did as well. You you said something interesting about uh, studies have shown that when there's this uh, policy that employees can take advantage of, they're actually more productive. Maybe there's more loyalty to the company in these days where uh, people don't feel like uh, the corporations they work for really are uh, invested in them as an individual. Um, in terms of the likelihood, uh, Catherine, of this uh, this session being passed, I mean, can you talk about um, what is before it now in terms of when will it could be voted on? Um, is there still a lot of uh, backlash against this? Well, we're very encouraged by the enthusiasm so far this session. There's tremendous interest among the legislature, um, among people in positions of leadership, and we're thrilled to see that. Certainly anyone who's tracking the happenings at the Capitol knows that this is a tough year in terms of the budget and other issues, Um, but we're very optimistic that there's energy and momentum to move this forward. It did pass out of the Labor Committee in a bipartisan vote uh, earlier this session, and we're thrilled to see that too because this is a bipartisan issue. Um, It's not about party lines. It, It impacts everyone throughout their lives. So we're excited to see so much enthusiasm, and we're hoping that in the next few weeks they'll vote this through. And Catherine, uh, before we let you go, any upfront costs that the state would incur um, with getting this kind of policy through um, if it were approved, implementing it rather? Yes, there are costs to start up the program um, within the Department of Labor. Uh, But, you know, what we are, and certainly that is, you know, a one-time cost, But then the program, after it starts running, will be self-sustaining and won't require any kind of a state appropriation each year. Um, So that's a huge benefit of this program. And, you know, what I think has become really clear is that there's a tremendous cost to not having this program. Um, It keeps people out of being unemployed, off of public assistance, out of increased hospitalizations. So there is a cost to the economy right now for not having this program. And if lawmakers want creative solutions to help fix our budget crisis, this is absolutely one of them. I want to thank Catherine Bailey, Deputy Director of the Connecticut Women's Education and Legal Fund. I want to go back to Arvia Walker, a political and social justice organizer involved in the paid leave campaign. Uh, we're going to have information on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live, about this event happening tonight, a seat at the table. But Arvia, how do we move past uh, tonight's event to keep this conversation going? Yeah, so I think tonight is a um, a perfect opportunity for women of color, for folks of color to see themselves in the campaign. Um, there's a bunch of different ways for folks to get involved. Um, next week, we're actually having um, a Mother's Day Lobby Day. Um, this is going to be a perfect opportunity for folks to, to share their stories and to share their stories and center um, the fact that they're a woman of color and their unique experiences. Um, that's going to be on May 11th, um, and it will be at the Capitol, and we'll be talking to our decision makers um, about why we need them to take action on paid leave. Um, We're also working with folks on the ground to host house parties, to write letters to the editors, to take action um, in their community spaces. Um, I just think this is a really great opportunity for folks to really um, get engaged and again see themselves in the campaign and to hear from other women of color who have experienced um, who have experiences with a lack of paid family leave. Arvia Walker, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. A seat at the table happening tonight, 6 to 8 at the Connecticut Nonprofit Center in Hartford. Again, more information on our website, WMPR.org slash where we live. Today's show is produced by Lydia Brown. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. Special thanks to Jeff Tyson. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.